Hey everyone, I hope you can see and hear me. Let me check. Let me also check with the colleagues if, if the tech is all right. Just a little bit. Yeah, in the meantime, welcome from um, from the fairly sunny Debrecen. Um, let's wait a little bit. Uh, let you guys uh, take a break uh, after the previous presentation uh, by Peter. Okay, everything should be smooth. Very nice. All right, so let's kick this off. Welcome everyone to the second presentation of uh, Z Nights 2020. Um, for this presentation, in the next uh, 30 minutes, I will guide you through a little um, pet project of mine, which I've been developing for two years. And I will tell you about the, the motivation, how it came to life, uh, what it can do, and what is in store for it in the future, and in general, um, how you can build your portfolio on GitHub if you are an aspiring uh, software engineer or software testing engineer, and what benefits uh, can it bring for you and uh, your career. All right. So yeah, as I mentioned, that will be a little bit of introduction from me, and then we will look at the, well, let's say the root cause of why I started this journey, and then some implementation details. I will tell you about a couple of challenges I faced, and then we will dive a little bit into testing aspects. Um, and by testing aspects, I mean uh, uh, bringing back the previous presentation, the, the lower level of the testing uh, pyramid, like uh, unit testing and, and uh, component integration testing. Uh, and then a little bit of um, a couple of sentences about continuous integration, uh, continuous development, and how um, you can achieve all this quite easily uh, with GitHub Actions, which is a fairly new feature of the platform. Um, and then some benefits, some statistics, and I will tell you about what I want to improve upon this uh, command line tool that I, I've been working on for two years. And then a little bit of Q&A for you guys. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to um, answer away either on, on YouTube in the, in the chat section or you can also find a chat section on the Community Z site itself. So yeah, uh, my name is Attila Jendeshi. I've been a software engineer for uh, uh, EPMW since 2013. I started out as a Java developer uh, back in the day, but um, yeah, I took a little turn <laughs> uh, halfway between and I am now uh, a JavaScript engineer, and then also leading a team of JavaScript and well, TypeScript developers. Um, I usually, I also do a little bit of uh, interviewing new candidates uh, for the office. Uh, and um, yeah, during the last half year, I, I try to be a, a bit of an aspiring uh, community organizer you know, bringing uh, together the UI developers of the tablets in Office a little bit closer. Um, if you are in Debrecen, um, if you live here or you are traveling here, um, I'm always up for a beer. I am glad to, to talk about software engineering, uh, music or, or the weather or software engineering, the music with weather. Um, and you can also find uh, me on, on GitHub, on LinkedIn, uh, on Twitter also. Um, yeah, so let's talk about a little bit of my motivation. Uh, why I started to do, why I started to implement a little bit of um, a command line tool, uh, a Node.js command line tool in the, in the first place. 
So yeah, this is all started with, uh, you know, uh, static analysis. <laughs> so the root cause lies in in a problem with, uh, with static analysis. And uh, yeah, what is static analysis? This is basically the process of checking certain aspects and certain rules or certain uh, criteria in your source code or, or any other source asset of your project without actually executing this uh, software itself, because that is a dynamic analysis. Um, there are a myriad of tools uh, for this, uh, uh, to achieve this, and you can check all kinds of different aspects of your project. Uh, this also depends on what kind of project you are working on, whether it be a, a web application or a mobile application and an embedded system, you, uh, you can do a lot with static analysis and it can help you to catch early issues early bugs or or issues with your code design in in the javascript ecosystem um, and if you are familiar with it these are usually called linters and yeah just a side note the, the, the word comes from you know the lint which is a little leftover fiber or, or fluff in your clothing um, so yeah, you can find these tools in every ecosystem, uh, basically. A little bit of um, background story for me. Um, in, in 2017, I joined a new project as a software engineer, a JavaScript software engineer. This was basically the point uh, where I officially turned from Java engineer to JavaScript engineer. And uh, I joined the, the project in a very interesting time because we started to think about uh, migrating a fairly legacy project to a new technology stack to be you know, uh, a bit more sustainable, uh, a bit more scalable, a bit more robust. Um, so the original stack included an in-house framework, uh, which basically um, encapsulated certain aspects of Node.js and AngularJS in, in, a, in a centralized way. And we were thinking about, you know, uh, moving to TypeScript, uh, trying out Angular 2, uh, this kind of stuff, uh, integrating Webpack as a means of bundling this application. So that was very interesting. And we had a lot of discussions, a lot of brainstorming on, on, on how to do that, and, you know, a lot of business alignment as well. And um, so by the end of 2017, we actually... I basically kick-started this whole uh, endeavor. And uh, right from the get-go, we realized that static analysis uh, will play a crucial part in, in a couple of aspects of the project. One of these, of course, is maintaining a sound code quality. Uh, and that would mean that uh, we will check the TypeScript code, we will check the uh, the styles, which were uh, SCSS files uh, with certain rules. We were also checking the HTML structure, you know. Um, this was uh, more like um, uh, coding style than, than um, uh, code design rules. Uh, we also had st uh, stuff like, uh, you know, a maximum uh, cyclomatic complexity, uh, maximum lines of code in a source file, these kind of stuff are all configured. Uh, we were using TSLint and StyleLint and HTML linter, um, all wired into our uh, build system, basically. So these were all automatically executed and evaluated, and if um, anything was failing, then it would stop the build process. And it was all nice and dandy. Uh, basically, but we uh, realized quite early on that uh, with all these rules and all these conventions, uh, something was missing. And this something was basically, uh, you know, developers started naming their source files in very different ways. Um, and the, 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 the code base of this migration started to look like a little bit of, you know, spaghetti regarding the file system. Uh, so the code was all fine uh, and checked and kept in quality, but we had um, 
very different naming conventions, uh, basically varied developer to developer. And we were thinking about, okay, it would be nice if there was a way to, you know, um, have this um, as a convention for the project for developers as well. So not just coding style, not just the HTML structure, but the the shape of the file system uh, would be consistent, at least naming convention wise, because you have all these different naming conventions like uh, camel case, uh, snake case, where you separate uh, words with an underscore, um, you know, all these all these different stuff. Um, so I was I was thinking. Uh, at this point, uh, and I, I was starting to look for tools to achieve this this problem. So this was the uh, this was actually the root problem. Um, I wanted to have a naming convention, enforce a naming convention for for directories and file names for our uh, project. So what do you do when you have a new idea? Uh, this is probably also true for Peter and the tri-layer testing architecture. Uh, you try to check if anything came up with, uh, anyone came that uh, came up with that idea before you. Uh, so I did a, little bit, did a little bit of search. This was back in early 2018. I did a little bit of search and tried to find basically no JS packages that would solve my problem. And I did find a couple. So the first one I found is uh, is a little something called ESLint plugin find names. And as well, the name, as the name suggests, it's an ESLint plugin. Um, if you're not familiar, ESLint is basically the de facto standard linter for for anything ECMAScript uh, related. Uh, and there's a plugin for for linting file names uh, in a project. And it has its ups and downs, and you know it supports regular expressions, which is good because then you can, you're not uh, uh, restricted by pre-built rules. You can define your own regular expression, and um, basically have your own naming convention, whatever you want to do. On the other hand, it has some built-in support for uh, stuff like kebab case, uh, which is the uh, naming convention when you separate uh, words with a dash, uh, or snake case, um, and that all works fine. But but I soon realized that there are some uh, you know, cons to this library, namely that it, it needs ESLint, because it's a plugin to ESLint, and back in 2018, um, uh, TypeScript projects were linted with uh, with TSLint. In the meantime, so right now the 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 you know the ecosystem has changed and the uh, TSLint projects basically merged uh, with TSLint itself. So right now this would not be that a big issue. But otherwise, it also um, brings in another dependency. Uh, so you, you uh, either way, ESLint is required for your project. Um, and then another shortcoming was that you can specify different rules for different um, folders, because that's uh, that's something that we were looking into uh, a little bit. That kind of flexibility it was it was lacking uh, with this stuff. And then I was also find uh, something which is called uh, FNLint. Or I, I guess it was a short for file name lint, um, which is not a really good library. It's kind of it was kind of abandoned. Only eight releases. Um, it only supported built-in rules, and with one execution of this tool from the command line, you can only specify one folder to to lint. So if you would have uh, different rules for different folders, you would need to execute this tool two or three times or four times uh, via it all together via a npm script or bash script or whatever. So that's um, that's not what I was looking for uh, for our project. And then uh, I also stumbled upon a stuff called file name linter, um, which was actually a pretty good library. Um, it was hosted on, on GitLab, uh, not GitHub. Um, it, 
it has a lot of very good features. It also supports regular expressions, so you can do whatever you want, basically. Um, but one of the issues uh, back in 2018 was one of the crucial features that I would I would need was not released yet. It was not even merged yet, and there was no sign of, of it ever being released because the re last release was like a year ago or a, a year and a half ago, I don't remember correctly, but a long time ago. Um, I actually checked this up uh, yesterday uh, while preparing for this presentation and I saw that it was indeed released. Uh, so in its current shape and form, it can be considered an alternative to, to what I built, uh, which is yeah an interesting uh, development. But anyway, um, so I looked around the, the Node.js package ecosystem and find these stuff, but uh, something was always missing for me. So I was like, okay, um, I, was, I was actually looking for a pet project to start uh, anyways, and I wanted to build something that is... You know that is something that I can release and and showcase for for the community and and something that can be used by others, not just for for my amusement. So this was a perfect opportunity. Um, so I created a little library which I named Parslinter. I probably not a very creative way, but uh, name, but uh, anyway, it does the trick. Uh, so yeah, um, in the summer of 2018, I started developing this, and the current technology stack is that it's, type, it's still TypeScript 3. Uh, of course, TypeScript 4 was released uh, uh, some time ago. Uh, it currently supports uh, Node.js 12, or at least this is the version of Node.js that I'm, I am actually developing against. Uh, more on this later. I am using Jest for doing testing, uh, both unit testing and, and integration testing. And um, for the bundling, uh, I use a tool called Rollup. I'm not sure if you JavaScript guys are familiar with this. I started out with Webpack, uh, but I realized that this is such a small project that uh, all the, the robustness and, and uh, uh, you know the, the hassle of Webpack might be too big for this one. Uh, I actually started, I actually tried out Parcel as well, but I found out that Rollup is uh, and sometimes easier to configure and also, at least in my uh, case, a little bit faster as well. So yeah, and then I have ESLint, of course, for checking the uh, code quality. I use my own set of, uh, of ESLint rules, which is also available on my GitHub. I use commit lint and I try to adhere to the conventional commit uh, standards. Look it up if you're not familiar. That's really cool stuff. Uh, I'm using Husky, which is a tool that you can use to automate the configuration of your Git hooks, which is also can be beneficial. And in a very, very meta way, uh, Passlinter uses Passlinter itself to well, uh, lint its file pass against a set of rules. Uh, the tool itself supports regular expressions because that's something I really liked um, and that gives you a certain flexibility, of course. And again, um, it's uh, usually quite fast. It supports uh, different uh, linting rules for different um, uh, directories of your projects. So you have that kind of flexibility as well. Uh, so far, I only built in a kebab case rule. So instead of specifying a length, say, uh, regular expression, you can use a keyword uh, to, to have this kebab case uh, rule. It has a nice uh, console output, gives you some information on the console. Uh, it can also be colorized. Uh, I really like this, you know, fancy outputs on the console. Uh, has different severity levels. So if you don't want to if you still want a zero exit code, you can set uh, the severity level to warning, so it will not uh, uh, fail any processes uh, if you wire this into a build pipeline. Uh, it is also operating system agnostic, 
which is a crucial point uh, during development and also during testing, because since uh, this library deals with uh, file system paths, and you know we have these different path separators and different path structures between uh, uh, Unix systems and Windows, it needs to be operating system agnostic. And how I achieved this, uh, I will talk about that in a bit. It also had zero dependency, so that's also cool, which is a good segue into one of the development uh, issues or, well, decisions that I faced in the beginning. Which is, okay, um, how do I want to do this? Uh, because, uh, yeah, one of the bane of uh, Node.js packages is that they are usually chock full of dependencies. Um, you you bring on you bring in one little library into your project and it brings uh, twenty other transitive dependencies with it, uh, clutters up your your node modules. Uh, even for stuff like you know padding strings, uh, this kind of trivial uh, stuff. So in the beginning, I was thinking about okay, do I need, do I want to include other dependencies? And um, yeah, my decision was no. Uh, let's keep it as lightweight as possible uh, and you know this has some pros and cons currently it's it's uh, so far so good it has zero dependencies uh, naturally the downside of this is that certain aspects i would need to code myself instead of using a third party library for example uh, parsing the the command line options that a user can supply or colorizing the uh, the console output. These are stuff that, uh, that that there are existing packages to do this for you, and I could have used the, you know, used those, but I decided to not. Uh, these are fairly little pieces of code that I was basically happy to implement. So this was also a a, a programming challenge for me uh, to do this. Of course, the, so this is easy on your dependency tree but uh, we'll raise the, the size of your library uh, a little bit. And it's another question is whether it is, is uh, sustainable or not. Uh, that I will see in the future. The other challenge, of course, uh, was during development is the, the very uh, operating system and environment agnostic way uh, to deal with, uh, with passes. Because how it looks like is that you specify your linting rules based on you know regular expressions, and of course you can write regular expressions that would match uh, uh, slashes and backslashes um, either way, or or you know uh, taking the um, the drives uh, for Windows into account or not. Um, you can achieve that with regular expressions, but that can be tricky. And um, I wanted to, you know, circumvent that a bit. So what I'm actually doing, or what the project is doing, you can check this on GitHub, of course. This is open source, as I mentioned. Um, I'm, I'm normalizing the pass uh, information. So every uh, file pass that I, that I iterate on is basically normalized to a, a, a way, so I detect what kind of operating system uh, the, the tool is currently running on, what kind of, of uh, path uh, uh, it is, and then shape it in a way that it's, it's uh, let's put it this way, it can be linted in a uh, operating system agnostic way. So this was a very cool challenge. Um, this, of course, a lot of regular, regular expressions are involved in the background within the, within the code for this. Uh, but that was that was a nice uh, uh, challenge for this library. And yeah, uh, once you have your implementation, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me dial back a bit uh, for the development. Uh, the the heart of this, uh, the heart of the the tool is basically an asynchronous uh, recursive uh, visitor that iterates over your uh, your folders and basically visits all the files and executes the corresponding uh, uh, linting rules. Uh, this is basically implementation-wise, this is a, a TypeScript class 
uh, you can find the file visitor class in the source code uh, if you are interested. Um, I do plan to have a couple of modifications uh, on that one for the next milestone of the tool, but um, yeah. And of course, yeah, let's start. Uh, let's just let's start to talk about a little bit of testing, because of course implementation is all fine, but uh, you need to make sure that everything is working as expected, and this has an even bigger emphasis when you are building something for the community. If you are building something uh, that potentially anyone can use, then you are obligated to to you know uh, document this properly and test this properly uh, so others won't bomb you with, with uh, bug reports. Um, the main testing approach, of course, this is all relying to, to the testing, uh, the standard testing pyramid. Uh, I have unit tests, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is built with just uh, every unit test uh, source file has a dot .ts uh, .ts um, extension and a dedicated just configuration that just um, uh, looks for these kind of uh, files within the, within the source code. Uh, it currently holds a 100% uh, coverage, which I'm kind of proud of. You can see the, the actual report uh, on the picture. Um, for certain, so this is um, standard unit test, right? So they adhere to the first uh, principles. Um, they are isolated from every uh, stuff that is going on in the code base. Uh, one of the challenges here was to mock the uh, platform specific stuff of, of Node.js. Uh, because I am I'm in certain cases of the application, I am detecting the operating system and I am detecting the path separator of that operating system. Um, this is happening through the OS module of Node.js, which is a built-in module. So I had to find a way to, to mock it. And um, yeah, fortunately, uh, Jest provides me with the right tool set to, to do so. So that was an interesting part in unit test uh, separation and isolation. I also have integration tests, which are, uh, well, I assume these are more like end-to-end -end tests. Uh, they have their own specific uh, uh, source files and their own dedicated just configuration files. Uh, so I can um, you know, execute unit tests and integration tests separately and, and have them evaluated and reported separately, uh, which gives a nice overview of, of what's going on. Um, it has a a pretty good uh, code coverage. So what it does basically is, um, so this is actually an end-to-end -end test, right? So you need a, so you need to build the tool in the first place, and then, um, as you would use it normally, you would spawn a child process, and the test suite would iterate over all kinds of scenarios with an actual running uh, instance of the tool. And this is one approach that uh, that you can use. Uh, one another thing that I uh, talked about uh, as an as an improvement is to, um, you know, uh, slice it up and and uh, have a function that I can call instead of uh, executing the the tool itself. And I see that I need to speak up a bit because I will be a bit uh, over schedule. Um, the test also relies on fixtures, which is basically a set of directories, uh, version controlled with different kinds of uh, uh, file structures that the integration test can go over and, and check, basically. So this is a preset environment uh, to check different end-to-end -end cases. Uh, yeah, I also mentioned that uh, this is uh, operating system agnostic, and the way I check that it is indeed operating system agnostic is that I leverage something which is called a matrix testing strategy, uh, and I will talk about it in a bit. So let's talk about automation and building the project and executing tests and automatically uh, evaluating stuff. Um, yeah, so in the case of, you know, CI and CD, um, 
Uh, you can see all the definitions of these uh, terms if you are not familiar. Uh, pass linter currently is on the, uh, let's say, the second step. So I have continuous delivery. I could uh, release a new version by a press of a button, but I, uh, for now, I don't have it end-to-end, -end, so it, it, it won't roll out a new version uh, automatically if, if I push a new uh, code to master or whatever branch. Uh, I am using configuration as code, and this is something that you will encounter if you want to use GitHub Actions. This is a uh, pattern where you would have your um, uh, any kind of configuration part of your um, uh, version control. And I use this for GitHub Actions. You can see the actual uh, uh, pipeline of mine here, and I highlighted the uh, matrix strategy that I am using, which is a great way to uh, specify uh, well, different environments or different aspects that you want to um, uh, have for your CI pipeline. In this particular case, um, I am executing my tests and builds against uh, Ubuntu as a Linux distribution, Windows and Mac OS, uh, and currently have Node.js 12, which can be extended to 10 or 14. And when I push a new code, uh, the test suite will be executed for all these different environments and can give you a nice idea that nothing breaks uh, anywhere. Yeah, really quickly, um, by so this, this, as a general, if you were a software engineer or software testing engineer, if you or you are interested in IT in general, um, if you have a side project that can keep you, you know, that's that's a good way to keep practicing coding, uh, try out new technologies. Uh, it will keep you up to date with what's going on in your field of choosing, like the Java ecosystem or the JavaScript world. Um, you can probably try out new things. For example, I haven't used GitHub Actions, uh, and this was a good opportunity for me to try it out. Um, this looks really nice. If you have a project like this, this is very nice if you put this on your resume and if you are trying to land a sort of an engineering job. Um, as I mentioned, I'm interviewing uh, JavaScript candidates um, for the last uh, two years, and I am I really like it if, if a candidate has a GitHub account uh, or an actual project that he worked on uh, so I can check before the interview. It gives us a lot of conversation points, a, a, a broader picture for the, for the interviewer. Um, it can speed things up. It's really nice if you build your, your uh, portfolio this way. Uh, yeah, some statistics. Uh, as I mentioned, I started in June 2018. Um, Speed-wise, and this is coming from our current EPEM project, it can lint 900 files in under 1.2 seconds, which is fairly cool. Uh, it is already used by two uh, GitHub repositories, which is also very cool. I'm really proud of that. Uh, some random uh, guys uh, found it on the internet and started using it. Uh, and I have a couple of uh, open issues uh, also, um, which I'm really proud of because they are, you know, feature requests um, and, and issue reports that I can I can work on. Um, yeah, for the future, uh, I plan to, you know, uh, try out new technologies, upgrading to Yarn 2, TypeScript 4, um, trying out ESBuild, which is a new bundler for, for uh, JavaScript and TypeScript projects. Uh, adding a couple of new features, make it available to be used programmatically, not just through the command line. Um, I have a couple of ideas uh, how to move forward with this one. And that is basically, uh, that's basically it. Um, sorry, I'm on, uh, over the schedule a bit. If you have questions, uh, you can find me uh, on the Community Z portal or under my talk. And I will do a quick check if there are questions right now.
Okay, I don't see any questions. All right. So as I mentioned, uh, feel free to ping me. Uh, you can find uh, my contacts on my Kubernetes Z profile if you have any questions. Check out the stuff on GitHub. And uh, yeah, sorry for being a bit over time. And see you next time probably somewhere. Cheers.